Hey guys, Kyle here. So, just before the show starts, I wanted to mention our Patreon. You can pay us $1 a month as a thank you, as a tip. You can pay $2 a month to get access to one of our bonus content shows, uh, episodes two days early, and a secret Discord chat where all of our Patreon donors get to go and hang out and talk with us directly. Then there's a $5 tier that you can donate to to get access to a whole bunch more content. Uh, we have multiple bonus episodes on there. So please check it out, patreon.com slash it gets weird. Uh, we don't advertise, we don't make money. So check it out and throw some money if you think that would be cool. Thanks. Welcome to It Gets Weird, our comedy show where we explore the unusual, the unbelievable, and the unexplored to try to make your world a little weirder. I'm Niall. And I'm Kyle. And I meant unexplained. I said unexplored, but... Oh, well, maybe we're, we're unexplored. I, I think, honestly, of. it's... it's We really could just have, like, a, a series of words that you can kind of swap out depending on podcast topic. I don't know if unexplored... Uh, maybe it, it kind it of really fits for this de- one. It depends on the topic, but you could definitely argue that some of these are unexplored. Yeah. Um... Niall, I feel like we, we, I've been gone for a whole week. Like, what what have you been up to? Like, what's what's going on? Well, it was Oscar season, so I was watching a lot of Oscar. Mo- like, we, Jules and I decided to try to watch all the best pictures, and I also went to go see the Batman, the Batman, the Batman. Um, I also uh started playing Far Cry Six. Okay, so like, it, I, it's it's been a lot of that. It's been a lot of like you know, I watching Drive My Car, and uh, and like. Didn't didn't really like Don't Look Up. Um, oh yeah, that I heard Amy Schumer told me that one was pretty good. So I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. side with Amy on this one. That's with, I haven't seen a- it. But look, Amy has been in more movies than me. That's, I've I've only worked on one movie, and I don't know if you can fully call that a movie, but it's so like I, I she, she is the expert. I'm here. just gonna take Amy Schumer. I'm sure Don't Look Up is if Amy's saying it, it's got to be good. You know, and that's kind of my. Uh, my go that's just like my what i a phrase i live by yeah so uh, <laughs> what amy say that's what i yeah, wake what up amy anytime say. someone asks me about something I, the first thing i check what amy say? everything everything now we're not talking about amy schumer today kyle oh uh, well i know uh, that i'm a this, little surprised but i figured you kind of earmarked amy schumer from the beginning of this podcast saying i'm gonna do the amy schumer episode please don't take that so oh. like I'm, I'm really trying not to step on your shoes step on your toes all of my fucking phrases are just wrong, <laughs> slightly wrong today. That's, <laughs> I, that's okay. I mean, I, I knew what you meant by step. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm, it's not like my toes are out. Like you can't, yeah, true. normally you have to go by like visual sort of indicators for phrases like that. And so, uh, yeah, you it, don't have, look, this is, <laughs> this isn't, no, this isn't no barefoot pervert podcast. That's right. I, we record <laughs> both wearing shoes. I, I had to start putting my shoes on because I would look over and I'd see Niall like licking his lips yeah. and stuff. And I'm like, okay, I guess I got to put the toes away. Yeah, so. it's it's a it was a real struggle. And luckily now we've got it in our like podcast contract that Kyle and I have with each we other. Ha- yeah, that uh, that shoes must be worn at all times for both of our safety. Um, Can you imagine running a podcast where you have like a contract <laughs> between the two hosts of like. Must I'm sure that shoes. I'm sure that not the shoes part, but like podcast contracts are probably much more common than than we would expect. Okay, sorry. Let me rephrase that. Can you imagine us having a podcast yeah. contract? No, that's I, insane. I, that would be wild. But but we also like <laughs> refuse to do ads and like th- this is this is not a um in in a lot of ways we're not the most professional podcast. And on and that's why I like it. Yeah, can I, can I say that? Look, I want to welcome you into my twisted mind, <laughs> and I can't do that if I have big brother, big pharma, right. big, big government breathing big, down my neck. Big deliverable meal. Yeah. Blue apron. Fucking. Big apron. Big apron. <laughs> <laughs> big meal kit. We can't For do real. that with big with big blue chew and big meal kit breathing down my dick. I d- <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. I did. I did. That kind implies they're sucking your dick now now like, think about that that's not exactly what the relationship would be but uh can can you i did i did discover that there is a the closest thing to like i could i could get behind that sponsorship was um there's a cryptid crate 
Yeah, I have seen that. And I, I, I discovered this recently. I was like, damn, that's okay. I can kind of see it. But the, here's the thing. We did commit to no ads. So uh, Cryptid Crate, you can uh, fuck right off. <laughs> no, I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> I'm sure it's fine. Oh, man. So <laughs> this week, Kyle. Yeah. I, I've, I feel like I've unintentionally fallen into like an interest in, in a certain category of things. And that's kind of um, early kind of foundational ufo cases like ufo abduction cases You're speaking my language this is my this is my bread and butter this is my jam and like yeah it <laughs> is it your peanut butter and it's jam? my peanut butter and jelly i uh, so th- this isn't i'm not gonna say this is like a super super famous one but i think it's it's somewhat known but it is um pretty early like it's it's 1954 to 1963 is okay. kind of the the era we're talking about for the actual UFO part of this. Yeah. Um, but the thing that I that I think is that is interesting to look at for this case specifically, and that's the case of Elizabeth Clarer, um, mm. is she's one of the first women to claim to have a sexual relationship with an extraterrestrial. Wonderful. I am so on board with this. I I I know I brought it up in like probably not I don't even think it was long ago, but like I remember looking at UFO books in elementary school from the mm-hmm. library and i i i feel like we recently talked about one that like really like sparked a memory in me where i was like oh my god i may have read about this the the sexual relationship with aliens ones mm-hmm. really stick out in my brain and there were at least three or four in the books that i remember running across probably antonio via lobo I via boat via, via boat bo- Bolos. I, I I can't remember. I know. It's not Lobo, but it's it's uh it, it it's the one that I did a little bit I ago. I think it was that one. Yeah. I do believe that was the one. So uh it's always exciting to find another first in which this time it is a woman who claims to have a sexual relationship with with UFOs, which I also was recently made aware of the song Everybody's Fucking in a UFO. Oh, really? You didn't know about I that one? I didn't know about okay. that one. So go ahead and cue that up in the background while <laughs> yeah. you listen to this episode. We'll have to add that to the, like, it gets weird anthems yeah, or something, yes. you know? It's, uh, man, so the the thing I also think is interesting about this is, like, it, Elizabeth Clare is from South Africa. Okay. So this is not a U- USA-centric. This isn't, like, a, an American UFO case, which I think is, is is an interesting, like, we we deal so much with American conspiracy, paranormal, supernatural, extraterrestrial stuff, yeah. like, because that's where we live that's it's it's one of the more the places that's the most like i don't know research for that stuff yeah a lot of the time it's it's an accessibility thing too like like i i mean the friendship case is the one that i think about where i'm like i wish i could get more stories directly translated but i i just don't know there's there's some missing pieces there so yeah so elizabeth claire from south africa uh she was born in 1910 uh, she grew up in uh, and actually studied music and meteorology in college in England. Okay. Um, and became actually a pilot for the Royal Air Force before working for the South African Air Force Intelligence, decoding German transmissions during, uh, what would that be, World War II? Um, what, what year is this? Uh, ni- around 1940s. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's World War II. Yep. Um, and then after that, basically, she was in South Africa and started having these, these UFO interactions. Now it, that, in about 1950, she read a book on UFOs and started to remember these long buried memories from her childhood. Um, and this, is, I want to tell like this because supposedly she first had her, she had her first contact at age seven, Okay, but she didn't remember this until later on like 1950. That's so this is a thing that we see quite frequently. Yeah. You, you, that that comes up a lot, I think, where, like, people will, like, in their telling of their experiencing of UFO stuff, they'll, they'll like, only hypnotic regression was able to unlock this, like, memory. So it even predates, like, the stuff that we know about in the yeah. canon, I guess. And honestly, like, with a lot of this stuff, so she was around, um, she died in 1994, I think. But I feel like there was even the long, the, the more recently you go, the more you start to get people, like, Oh, I have these repressed memories. I have these like that become there. I don't know where that really comes from in terms of like what 
case or incident or whatever popularized that as a concept, whether it was like mm. MK Ultra Could or if it was. S- do you think, didn't, I would think maybe Betty and Barney Hill. I could see because, that. that was hypnotic regression, right? Yeah, because that's where they, the hypnotic regression was like a big thing. And I think that like it, the idea of hypnotic regression becoming popular in relation to these UFO cases, it's like, well, now people are going to be like, oh, you're unlocking memories. Okay, well. Uh, I'm experiencing UFO stuff now, but uh, also my brain has, I, I'm i I'm convinced I have experienced UFO stuff in the past too, and we're just now unlocking it. So I, I guess it would make sense that after that, like, I don't know, quote unquote technology, yeah. like comes onto the scene, people would start getting UFOs that were buried. Yeah. So here here's some of her early contactee stuff. At the age of seven, Elizabeth and her older sister, Barbara, had their first UFO encounter. They were feeding their Sealyham Sealyham puppies. I don't know what that is. Some type of dog, maybe. Or (laughs) could be just the name of something. I really don't know. Uh, They're outside the farmhouse where they lived, and they claim to witness a silver disc bathed in a pearly luster, which swooped down above them. Simultaneously, a giant orange-red and cratered planetoid was observed orbiting and rotating high in the atmosphere. The disc would then rush up to kind of get to go back to that big planetoid. And eventually there was like guided up to it. And then they both left with the planetoid leaving a smoke trail behind it. Okay. Wait, so this, this UFO comes with a planetoid. Yeah. How big are we talking? It, I don't have exact dimensions of that, but there is later on, there is a kind of, uh, guide ship mothership aspect to her ufo encounters okay so i'm curious if that planetoid was some sort of um actual like mothership type thing that mm. that because that one we'll get to it later but that thing was like five miles wide i was gonna say i feel like i, I feel like to be classified as a planetoid you're gonna have to be like noticeably large yeah but th- w- does a seven-year-old know the size of a planetoid i, I guess that's i fair. realize that this yeah. is like the the recounting of it later so it, it probably has been filtered through um but but th- that's just kind of the it's what she said yeah fair so. enough uh only months later she would have another sighting while in the company of uh, a person named ladam who was their zulu farm manager ladam interpreted the sighting in terms of various zulu mythology and um Elizabeth would also claim possibly to have an even earlier sighting in 1913 or 14, but doesn't really have any anything about that. That would have been when she's three years old, so I don't really know how much of that would have stuck with her, you know? Wow. I mean, can you imagine the conversations, though, with this kid of like, oh, what was your first memories? Well, technically, I think it was about a UFO. Yeah. I think it was, it was not only just a small UFO, but also a giant thing like i guess ufo because it, it is it does meet uh, the, y- the crux of you know unidentified flying object even yeah. though it looks like a planetoid but a i planet- saw these massive things up in the sky that kind of hung out for a minute hey, and then left very often i think planets are ufos essentially so <laughs> got it yeah that's yeah Ugh. so th- there's a little more of like her her life she she then didn't seem to have any more um ufo encounters throughout college as she grew up like so there's just like a there's a period when she was a very small child then a big gap when she was going to college in england uh she moved to florence italy to study art and music um she got a diploma in cambridge and was got married started to fly aircraft and joined the air force and then the moved back to South Africa to do that for their air force and then joined a, and formed a, a, a polo team. Oh, okay. And was seen as, as part of, literally one of the first officially recorded ladies matches in all of South Africa. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so. <laughs> literally like a polo pioneer in South Africa, which is kind of wild. Yeah. Like this, this lady had an interesting life. Uh, she then, um, in a 1937 flight from Durban to Baragwanoth, in a leopard moth aircraft, she and her husband saw a saucer which approached them, kind of came up beside them and just kind of kept pace with them, just kind of like hovered next to them, and then flew off. 
I'm I'm sorry. I, the UFO is pretty wild, but I am also a little fixated on the fact that the craft they're in is called a leopard moth. Yeah, I don't know why it's called that. We, we, Garrett would know. Yeah, but I, I, I maybe we should we need to start having like a phone Garrett section to the <laughs> yeah. podcast whenever there's phone like a friend. military yeah. shit or bird death. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so pretty eventful life. Yeah. She also, I guess, as a child, believed in telepathic powers and tried to like bring those about in herself, like do, enhance her do telepathic some powers. Yuri Geller shit. I think so. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't have a lot of specifics on that. She she wrote like a full like a, a book called um called Beyond the Light Barrier, which is uh. I think pretty pretty available out there. You can, I I didn't get to read it because I had to I would have had to buy it and um may, maybe for a bonus show, but it so like a lot of the stuff is kind of pulled from quotes in that and stuff and interviews she did. And so it, it's um I don't have a lot of details. The telepathic stuff, I think, comes in play later. A, a lot of these these UFO like experiencers, abductees or what what have you, it, it's it's like they're basically like lining up to spin a wheel and that wheel will determine the three like other supernatural things in their lives that, mm-hmm. that and and a lot of times it's uh it is telekinesis so yeah and because of some of the way she talks about it i'm getting kind of ahead of myself here but the way that sh- that the um her encounters with ufo's and, and aliens kind of progress and how she talks about them throughout her, her later years she gets into some of the like higher planes of existence and kind of vibrations uh-huh. and shit. Um, and I yeah. feel like that kind of gets into like opening, having your, like ascending your mind and, and doing all those kinds of things with like, so, uh, so I'm curious where that kind of um, spirituality comes from other than just being alive at that point in time and being yeah. a part of this community, because she does kind of become a, a, a point of reference. Like, I'm pretty sure in my I I I'll, I think it's in my notes further down, but uh, Adamski actually like comes and like interviews her. Oh really? Ah, yeah. So Adamski, that's an that's an important figure, even though he's he's pretty well full of shit, full of shit. But but very much an important figure at this period of time. It is interesting because like I like okay, I have like a pretty clear picture in my mind of what. The, like, because this is veering into new age territory, right? Like, a little bit. A little yeah. bit, sort of that spiritualism infused with UFO stuff. And I have a pretty clear picture of what that looks like in the United States, mm-hmm. uh, especially during this time. But obviously that has to be happening in a lot of different places around the world. But I feel like you're, like, a lot of those th- things, like, like yes, in, in the United States, we're, like, sort of, like, reaching over and like borrowing this like idea of like Eastern mysticism a lot Mm -hmm. of the time. And I feel like that's probably pretty much a ubiquitous thing with that stuff. But like, I think also part of it has to go through the filter of like the local, like spiritual, like culture and, and and things like, and beliefs. So I'm, I don't know. I'm curious if it, if it like has a lot of differences in in what she believes there because of that. There's really, I ha- there's a lot about what she supposedly learned about these aliens. I didn't get a whole lot of information at, when it came down to like how she processed that as like a belief system. Uh, okay, that, that's fair. I, I got some, but it's, Might it's have to read more just like the the story is is wild enough at without those things. Without, yeah, uh, because because like I haven't I, I've kind of buried a lead here specifically because this is one of the first cases as far as I know that claims to have a um uh, an alien child of course i no that i knew that was coming yeah. I, I i that was another thing that would pop up in those books of people having children with aliens which yeah. i don't know i mean I, I think about the logistics of that that one a lot of the times too i think will tie into this idea of like ancient aliens too cuz like that that's oh am i am i did i hit on something We'll, if so, we'll get there. Okay, cool. cool, uh, cool. You, this Niles this, eyeing me. I'm kind of I'm 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 trying not to get too far ahead of our, myself because they're like you'll just start checking off boxes here in a couple minutes. Yeah. Let, let me just I, uh, I gotta stop. Let me yeah, get go to ahead, the, go the actual meat of the story because all of this <laughs> stuff is just like oh yeah I might have seen a, a flying saucer when I was a kid. Now we get into what is known as Flying Saucer Hill, which is I th- I don't think the official name. It's just what she called it because that's where she met up with a bunch of flying saucers. Now. In 1954, um, 
she was with her sister May, who is in the Natal Midlands in, in South Africa. Uh, supposedly, the native Zulu people of the area were reporting appearances of, of a lightning bird in the sky. Um, in response to this, Elizabeth and her kids traveled from Johannesburg to the farm in the Natal Midlands in Whiteleaf, I think. Uh, and they started to go to F Flying Saucer Hill starting on about December 27th. Which, just important to note that Flying Saucer Hill, it's a lot like Salisbury Hill because that's where they created the stake. And um, so that just the the naming convention there is yeah these aliens didn't bring pancakes they brought steak yeah <laughs> a little yeah. bit of an upgrade yes no uh she, she claims to have seen um a, a starship descend and hover three meters above the ground while kind of softly humming uh and and the whole kind of outer shell of it was spinning around its central dome that remained stationary she would try to go up and get a closer look but she was pushed away by this like very hot air that was coming out of the craft and straight up like w w just you could not get close to it. However, she be then began to have telepathic communications with a being inside the craft that identified himself as Akon. <laughs> okay. And he <laughs> said that he was from the planet Meton in the galactic region of Alpha Centauri. And also he was a crew member uh, and scientist aboard the craft that that she was seeing, um, and and she could actually see his outline and like see him a little bit through this porthole in the side of the spacecraft. So he was identifying himself as the person that she was seeing, even though she couldn't get close. Um, and here here's a painting of Akon. I mean, I mean that's just a dude. That's Colin Mockery. <laughs> It really does look kind of like Colin Mockery. It looks like Colin Mockery playing Dracula. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that I think that's pretty accurate. So, did he do like a funny improv bit, or like he was just like, uh, "I'm here to siphon your nuclear power"? No. At, at this point, the 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 craft just kind of left. Like it it after this little conversation, there's this brief exchange, and the craft went away. This is the fuck. This is. This is the intergalactic equivalent of catching somebody's eye when you're sitting at a traffic light and you both nod to each other and drive off. Yes, basically. You're you're not far off. Like the this is the the like just initial like hey sup yeah, and then like, leaving. One person's going hey sup, the other person's going what what in the fuck is happening? Yeah, it's like it's like <laughs> I mean it, it is exactly like if if a UFO just came down and just like Buzz. Gave you like a peace it, sign and then just like flew away. It literally reminds me of um uh the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where they're like describing like buzzing underdeveloped planets. Yeah. That's what it just makes me think of. You're right. That's <laughs> I'd forgotten about that. Man, it's been a long time since I've read those books. I should I should do that again. So after this, Claire became kind of obsessed with Flying Saucer Hill. Sure. As, as, as you, you would, might expect. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh so she would go back various times to try to see the ship again. Can I just say, I understand that. Yeah. For, coming from, that makes perfect sense to me. If this had happened to me, I probably also I would, have would been try in, to set up shop hey, there. Hey, I'm interested now. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and we're like, we're like 70 years later and not in South <laughs> Africa. Yeah. So, eventually, in 1956, she would get her chance to actually see Akon again. Uh, and it was on April 7th, she, Akon came down and actually took her aboard the, the the scout ship, which was about 60 feet in diameter. Um, when she went inside, she met a second pilot who was kind of stocky and darker skinned than Akon. And he was supposedly the foremost botanist besides astrophysicist in their, like, group. Like, the, he, so they, like, they basically, this, this was like a scout ship for, like, um, scientists, effectively. Okay, okay. She also was then supposedly shown a lens which offered views of Earth and people through the craft's floor. So, like, that basically so they can do, like, surveillance and stuff of, uh, through the, the floor of the craft. There's, like, it's like a glass-bottom boat, but a UFO. <laughs> okay, wait. That's, in, okay, interesting, I, yeah. I guess. I, I'm, I, like, when I picture UFO surveillance of planet Earth, like, I picture, like, a... a like some sort of screen that like lets them like look at literally anything on the planet, not just like a glass bottom. Yeah, I mean it's a little more advanced than that, I think. But it it that really feels like the way this is coming off. Like it, 
there is a lot more technology later, but th- this feels very just like, okay, yeah, they just come down and look around. Yeah, I <laughs> I mean, they say they're scientists, but, like, maybe they got on, like, the the kind of... They were like, yeah, the only ship we got right now is a tourist viewing ship for Earth. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, take it or the, leave it. This is like the, the double-decker open-top bus right, of right. UFOs. This is when they take you out on one of those boats where you can see all the little fish swimming yeah. beneath you. Uh, so, so, like, that that hum kept kind of emanating from the craft, and it didn't feel like it was moving, but... All of a sudden, they were at this enormous cigar-shaped mothership uh, that was about five miles in length that when they went inside of it, there were cities, parks, trees, flowers, and even lakes. Oh. Like, this is like a fully uh, a, just biosphere. Like a, yeah, bio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, she, she spent some time on this vast mothership meeting various other inhabitants of it. Um, she said they looked just like humans, only taller, better looking, more considerate and gentle, wow. not aggressive and violent. That's just the power of space communism, baby. Yeah. These are just really chill, tall, yeah. pretty humans. Hell yeah. Which like they look they look kind of Nordic in terms of like I showed you the yeah, picture. The, the, yeah. And we said it looked like Colin Mockery, but like it's that kind of like really fair skinned, light haired. Yeah. That, that's Akon. That's the classic uh human alien thing and I, I always that the Nordic alien thing always gave me some weird vibes because oh, it can yeah. be used for some weird weird shit. Yeah, like it. it look, there, there is kind of a, some heebie-jeebie vibes coming from the whole Nordic alien being yeah. like this peaceful evolved race. Like they're but, so beautiful. And did I mention that they're white? All of them are white. Did I mention that? Yeah. By the way, they're so perfect. Did I mention they're, they're white and they're beautiful? Yeah. Also, they're white. I just wanted to get that out there. How's how are people feeling about that? They're white. We're cool. Okay, cool. Yeah. Just just wanted to mention that. So these are actually beings that originally come from the planet Venus. To get more penis. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh so so these are these are actually Venusians. Okay. Um and but they relocated to Meton eons ago after Venus became uninhabitable. Which you might ask, why did it become uninhabitable if they're so perfect? That question did not get answered for me. Oh, well, shit. I thought you were going to have an answer. It got too stinky. P.U. I mean, it literally was just saying that long ago it had been alive with vegetation and it was very much like Earth. But it gradually become a hostile environment, forcing them into an exodus, which brought them to their new faraway home of yeah, Medon. Yeah, stank so nasty. Yeah, they all farted too much and it's, it got really stinky. <laughs> that is kind of cool to think about, though. Like, oh, we have interstellar travel, like, Real easy, like, and this planet just got too nasty fart smell, and we just got out of there. Actually, sorry, I do have some answers about Venus. Oh, well, okay. I, I forgot that this was in here. So I, I was pulling from a couple different places, and this is from, I think it's from her book. Uh, so here, here is from actually Elizabeth Clare. The Venusian scientists recognized that the sun was a visible star with maximum and minimum periods of sunspot cycles, which happens to this day. But at certain epochs in time, it expands. Now, the sun is expanding and contracting all the time. It is pulsating like a heart, but at certain epochs, it expands out more in intensified radiation. Now, this is what happened to Venus, and being closer to the sun, her seas had dried out, and what little fauna remained and all the flora were destroyed. And then, of course, the dinosaurs, which had dominated the Earth, Earth, were also destroyed through the intensified radiation. Okay, so that's sort of some alternate little bit stuff for the dinosaurs. Thus, the great civilization from Venus, which we call the mother planet, was able to get away from Venus and landed on Earth and on the moon as way stations. They moved to Meton, which is now the home planet, because it is very similar to the mother planet Venus in atmospheric conditions, distance from the star, and also, the more important of all, the higher vibratory rates, which is more compatible Uh to an uh advanced civilization and consciousness. Okay, here we go. Now, they did have bases on the moon, Mars, and Earth, which they still visit. The Venus people left a section of their civilization here on Earth to look after the planet and advance the mentality and consciousness of the indigenous people of this planet, which they are in the process of doing. So there's there's a little bit check, 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 check. I could have probably, like, stumbled into a significant amount of those by just just, uh, the direction we were heading. But but that is that is funny to me, though, that, like, like they're like, yeah, we had to get the fuck out of Venus because, like, I don't know, that stuff got real shitty, 
it was stinky. The sun was bearing down on it really bad. But also, we did leave behind an, an away team. Yeah. Uh, to just, like, keep track of the, the fucking apes on Earth. Like, yeah. I don't and, know. And so, supposedly, later on, I have more on this, but the base on Earth was Atlantis. Oh, oh okay. Of course. Right. Because this is ancient aliens, and of course it's Atlantis. Uh, so, so like, yeah, th- this this is where it kind of, you know, dovetails into ancient aliens and how, like, v- Venusians... Um, started to kind of intermingle with with earth beings and uh do stuff to raise the consciousness and evolved human ev- like sped up human evolution. Yeah, the Venusians are like sit like on standby with like you know clipboards and checking stuff off in boxes and they're like man we really got to do something to accelerate this evolutionary process and these humans really got to give them something what now what if we gave them a bunch of drugs? <laughs> yeah. What if we what if we just gave them like a shitload of hallucinogens and just see what happens? Are, are you talking about stoned ape theory here? Uh, that's it's not stoned ape theory, it's stoned ape fact when the Venusians step in. <laughs> They're uh, intervening to get us all fucked up on ayahuasca. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, I, I I think this is interesting. Like a lot of people claim, oh yeah, this is very similar to the supposed kind of um, arrangement. Her her dealings with with uh, with Akon seem very similar to stuff with Adamski um, and Orthon, which I guess is 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 true. Like this is in that vein, and I think that's why there was like some interest there. Yeah. Um, well, and I think Adamski was one of those people who tried to get in contact with a lot of the other contactees too. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there's a whole, we covered Adamski, I know, but there's, there's like a, it might be important to do a like history of this, like 20 years of UFO stuff Mm -hmm. and contact just the the contactees generally. Cause like, I feel like it would give us a really good picture of, of this era and our our listeners. So maybe maybe that's a topic. There there are so many of these stories that follow similar beats. And I, I feel like they're, if you try to p- piece them all together, you might get some understanding of like, Oh, this is kind of the, where this, these ideas came from. Yeah. And it kind of was telephoned through all of these different people into what we now know as like basic contactee lore. Yeah. You know, uh, because this really feels like, Oh, everyone's pulling from these same t- primary sources, whether that's like, one specific case that came before these people or some sci-fi book or some belief of the time through some religious, like kind of spiritualism, like cult type thing. I don't know exactly where it came from, Yeah, but it would be interesting to find that out. Now, supposedly during this encounter with Akon up in, up in the mothership and in the scout ship and all that stuff, there was a little bit of flirtation. Um, <laughs> okay. And eventually there were even some little, some smooches back and forth. Okay. So they kiss. They did kiss. And this this also led to Akon revealing that Elizabeth was actually a reincarnated Venusian. And actually, not only a reincarnated Venusian, but specifically Akon's <sighs> long-lost soulmate. Oh, wow. Okay. Who, okay. who, who the, he had been romantically involved with when the race lived on Venus. He explained that uh, various Venusians would take uh, Earth women as partners as the offspring would strengthen their race and bring in an infusion of new blood. Um, he also claimed that Venusians were surreptitious, surreptitiously living amongst earth kind. So all of this is oh, just like, Oh, that's... Hey, let's, let's smooch. Also, you're a reincarnated Venusian. Who's also my long lost soulmate. And Hey, we kind of bring We kind of fuck earth women sometimes just to like strengthen our race. How does that work for you? Are you cool with that? Hey, look, so I was, look, so here's the thing. One, it's been great hanging out. Yeah. It's been really great. That kiss meant a lot to me. Now, I do have this whole sort of angle that I haven't really brought. For, so, like, we... So, like, look, if I were to, I don't know, drop a load <laughs> in ya, and we could, like, maybe uh. get some, like, hybrid alien, like, Venusian Earth. Like, this is... The, and don't give me that look. This is a thing that... Venusians and Earthlings have been yeah, doing for this so is long. Just, this is just how we work. Like this is just a thing we do. It's part of my culture. 
yeah. So if you don't mind, it would be kind of cool to like blast some of my <laughs> shit into you. Look, the trip back to Ven- to the trip back to Meton is really long. <laughs> yeah. Can I? <laughs> God damn it. So. <laughs> it, it over the course of this encounter and everything and, and seeing uh, Akon's ship kind of a couple times, supposedly Elizabeth Clare took a couple pictures. Okay. And did we... I have one picture here. Okay. That is of the scout ship up in the sky that was taken with uh, a um, a brownie box camera, whatever th- mm. that is. That is an interesting picture. Yeah. It does kind of look like they threw something up into the air. <laughs> it's funny but, that you mentioned that. Finish oh it, my god, are you thought. fucking serious? Uh, just just finish your thought. Okay, well, no, I, I was just saying it, it looks like they tossed something up in the air, maybe like an acorn, or it, it can't be an acorn. It has to be something a bit bigger than that, but it does look like that. So there were a couple a couple people that supposedly saw this UFO at the same time. Um, various independent observers noticed this like uh, kind of glow on the hilltop and maybe some sort of craft coming down. Um, but there was, uh, so a, a person named Edgar Sievers, who was a ufologist from Pretoria, which is one of South Africa's capital cities, stated that her family saw um, Elizabeth leave the hem- home, her homestead alone and suggested that Elizabeth would have found it difficult to throw a car hubcap, which is what people thought this thing was, ah. up into the air and photograph it at the same time. He also stated that no make of hubcap had been illustrated to sufficiently resemble the disc in the photos. So basically, people did think that this was a photo of of Elizabeth throwing a hubcap up in the air and taking a picture. Okay. But this ufologist was like, no, no chance. she's kind of got weak arms. I don't see how That's she could really throw a hubcap unfair. and also take a picture at the same time. She seems kind of like she's uncoordinated. Like, uh, what? It- <laughs> so this guy is just like, well, it's probably not faked because she's just so shitty. Yeah. Like that's fucked up. How do we like get her get a hubcap in her hand? Just like see if we can pl- do some discus throwing. Also, like also, it doesn't look exactly like any of these hubcaps that I've seen. Okay, like it doesn't yeah. have to be a hubcap, dude. It could be a whole bunch of different things. Give me a couple minutes to look at it, and I'll develop some ideas for you. It could be like a, a dentist lamp. You know it that be- that's a classic. Yeah. That is a classic. That's the Adamski method right there. It was yep. a dentist, or I think the other thing was like maybe a chicken coop. Yeah, uh, I think lamp. you're right. Uh, but it, either way, those were like, yeah, it's, oh my God. Okay, whatever. This, but I thought, th- I just thought that was a funny note that like this person was like, no, 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 it could, it has to be a UFO because she, this because girl can't use a camera sucks. and throw yeah, a hubcap at the same time. Jesus Christ. God. <laughs> yeah. That's so, so unfair. She's just like standing by, like as he presents the evidence, she's like, what the fuck, man? Yeah. <laughs> no, she almost like, the, the the entire grift almost falls apart because she's like, what, what the fuck? Yeah, I can I can do that. And just <laughs> what grabs a hubcap. <laughs> Even funnier if she's like actually just like yoked. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, she was she was in the air force and she was in the 1950s, a notoriously sexist time. And not that uh, we did solve it a couple decades ago. Yeah. But I'm just saying, like in the 50s, it's uh, <laughs> it's really a big problem. Yeah, it's it it, it does seem like kind of a weird reasoning for all of that stuff i I don't know but i thought it was funny enough to bring up so (laughs) now we move on to uh, 1958 because there's kind of been a series of contacts between akon and elizabeth um and and these visits culminated in like a multiple like day-long uh meetup between elizabeth and akon on what's known as the plateau of kathkin peak where he supposedly presented her with a silver ring, which actually enhanced their ability to talk telepathically. And at this point, when she got that ring, once Akon put that married. ring on it, uh, they consummated their their love. Okay. Not married. We'll, we'll talk about more, that more in a minute. Oh, boy. Uh, and this was at the point when the child was conceived, even though at this point, if, you did, if you've done the math, I don't know if you've been keeping track of this, but Elizabeth was 48. At this point. Okay. I did not keep the math, but but I knew it had to have been older. Yeah. Okay. So here's here's what Elizabeth... Elizabeth said this about, you know, the whole, like, um, fucking an alien thing. Yeah. I surrendered in ecstasy to the magic of his lovemaking, our oh. bodies merging in magnetic union as the divine essence of our spirits became one. So 
There you go. I mean, hitting it raw can be like that. Uh, I think. I think she. Uh, I, yeah. Anyway, he did not. He did not use a I, Venusian condom. What's fucked up is I actually do have some some info about uh, about yeah. Meton birth control, oh which my we'll get God. to later. What the f- There's <laughs> look. There are some interviews that that uh, she did along with wow. stuff from her book that that goes really deep into the culture of these of these aliens that I think is really interesting. So I've got a bunch of that later. We'll talk about it. I want to picture like a bunch of reporters standing in front of her, like, ma'am, ma'am, what's the uh, what's the Venusian penis like? <laughs> like clearly they have to have somewhat similar parts, oh, it's thick, right? Like it's thick as shit. It's like a it's, Coke bottle. Yeah, it's things thick as shit. Not that long, but like. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a hockey puck. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so after after having most of the pregnancy on Earth, uh, she was eventually transported in 1959 to Meton, um, which they note that Meton is one of the seven planets that uh, this race of Venusian aliens, the, the, one of the seven planets that they claim is their own in this one solar system in um, Alpha Centauri. So they they have now spread over multiple planets and are just kind of living all those places. It always seems to be Alpha Centauri, by the way. It's far enough away that that we can't go there, and close enough that we that someone could actually come here if they're really I good guess. at tech. We, we, somebody's come up with another one. That's all I'm going to say. Just I, mix it up a little bit. Yeah, I think I think we do have like it's like the Raelians and stuff. Like another, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Anyway. So supposedly Clara would actually stay on Meton for four months and give birth to their son there, who they named Ailing, A Y L I N G, like as in sickly. It sounds like he he was it does sound like that, but it's spelled differently. Okay. It's spelled it's spelled in like a sci fi way. There are no right, apostrophes, right. but uh, we hadn't quite gotten to that level of sci fi naming yet. Uh, so so Clara described the planet in pretty in depth detail, including their government, educational system, way of life, and even flora and fauna. Uh, she described Meton as a utopian society with no war, crime, or poverty, and everyone has very equal access to food and energy. There's no money, and they have unlimited renewable energy. Everyone wore, like, very luxurious silk clothing and it lived in expensive, expansive parks. And because there were no tall buildings or factories, there was no pollution. And all education was done through telepathy and similar other means. So there are no school books or physical school buildings. You know, I do so desperately want this place to be real. It'd be great. It'd be yeah. cool. Especially since uh, with all the. Well, I mean, if if they're all just like so much like just like more attractive human beings, like they're all just really chill, no aggression, very, very kind and also very, very hot. And that's that's, that's really the most important thing. And that's all you could really ask for in an alien. So she did. A, she did an interview uh, with a researcher named Stuart Bush, in which she described Meton in this way: "It is similar in size to Earth, a little larger though, covered with vast seas, and the li- lands are islands, not continents. Okay, climate is beautiful, under control, and in fact is really a utopia. They have everything they want. They're not only thousands of years ahead technologically from us, but are also spiritually very advanced. There are no politics, law, or monetary system." Medicine is a scientific activity and not required for health since they are all in perfect health. Now, that raises the question of what is medicine for if it's not for health, but that's neither here nor there. The way of thinking is quite different from what most people over here would understand. They are loving, gentle, and constructive people. Everyone industriously does their work, which they like doing most. There is no need for law. There is no crime or police. Everyone is free and has a code of ethics. They constantly create beauty around them, and in general, there is complete harmony. Their homes are lovely. You can see from the inside out. The material is transparent one way. They don't have schools or universities. Their education is completely visual. All by all is done by what is called an electric mirage. They have a little file about three inches long, and they insert it into a niche in their home or the wall of a spaceship. A 3D scene fills the room, which is an advanced form of a holograph. There are no books. They travel a great deal. The young children are taken around the galaxy so they can learn from their experience. They can use the electric mirage to go back to a former time in their history. They could, for instance, view our planet at the time of the dinosaurs. They have beautiful paintings and create lovely music, harmonic music, very uplifting spiritually, which relates to the harmonic music of the galaxy. 
They communicate by means of telepathy and educational concepts can get transferred this way. They are capable of thinking in terms of the basic concepts, not dependent on language. They perceive the feelingness behind words. There is no problem in learning of languages such as any of those on Earth. Okay. Well, it's, so it makes sense that they're so compatible with Earth humans. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, that's just basically how we are. Yeah. It, it, it really, really, a lot of that reads to me very similarly to... Um, Stranger in a Strange Land shit. Yeah. That's what that is to me. Yep. Very similar. So I guess that's pretty fun for her if it actually happened, but you know. Yeah. I, uh, I it, this is, I, I think all of these things are interesting because of how it really represents a mirror of like what people think a utopia is. <laughs> that's true. You know, like yeah. at any given time in history, like when people talk about, that I always think of science fiction as such an interesting reflection of the time that it's written in. And like this, you can look at this as, as a piece of science fiction effectively. And so this person, um, believes in this Venusian world or Meton, sorry, they're in, Venusians live there, but they're on Meton. And the thing that they want is big parks, not having to go to school, being able to travel a lot, creating really cool music and art, and not having war hanging over their heads at any given time. I mean, time. yeah, sign me up. It really is like this is this is clearly just like a desire. Yeah, and, of, and like I think you can almost strip away in a in a utopic setting that like oh, there's no money and no crime, and because like those things are just kind of baseline for what you would consider a utopia, and like the right. details, I think, are what are most reflective of what where whoever is describing it where their head is. Yeah. And especially like I don't I don't know exactly the South African climate in the 1950s, but I I can see this being um I mean just think about the world climate. Yeah. Right? Like I mean sure that her that's where she lives, but like I think you could probably assume that just about anywhere in the world there was some some reason to desire a better place. Yeah. And so it's just it's interesting to look at these things as a reflection of like the psyche of the person yeah. writing them. Yeah, it is interesting. And like, I don't know. I, I, I hear these utopias about these like aliens who have like perfected like reality for mm -hmm. themselves. And I'm like, like it suggests that there's like no need for power, right? Yeah. Like they don't have power or exert power in any, in any way. But like, 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 if you think about, like, uh, then what need is there for, like, quote-unquote, this, like, sex and lovemaking, right? Like, that's, like, a power dynamic for humans. So, I, I just, like, I wonder, because it, it's a pure, it's a pure, uh, like, it's a pure display of the human condition. Like, pe people right, really, like, right. look at, at, at love and sex as this, like, baseline thing of, of just be, being a, a, a being like being a part of a, of a race of beings. Yeah. And, and so like, I, I can see where we'll get into, I, I have more on that and here in a minute in terms of how it relates to this specific utopia, but it is, it is does raise question of like the whole thing about like, Oh, they still, they still research medicine, but it's not they because do, people get sick. Yeah. They do it's a scientific things. pursuit. Yeah. What, why, what does that mean? What, they're, they're, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No. I don't mean to talk. It's just like that. There's particular things in these like alien utopias where it's like, well, for what reason? It, it no longer makes sense to me that they would like do X. Yeah. You know, and like they perceive the feelingness behind words. D okay. Are they empaths? Is that what we're talking about here? Yeah. It's. It's. Yeah. I get what she's saying, but like, if you like tried to like literally like go with what she's saying, it 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 makes very little sense. Yeah. So, um, her son Ailing stayed on Meton. However, Elizabeth couldn't stay there because the Meton's planetary vibrations, quote unquote, mm -hmm. affected her heart and <laughs> she had to go back home because it, it, it's something to do with like the way she describes it. The magnetic field of Met Meton was operating at, you know, we're talking about the higher vibrational frequency of, of, of like these advanced yes, cultures and stuff. Yes. She couldn't, she couldn't vibe with that. <laughs> Literally. Like it was like killing her to Listen, stay on Meton because she's a less advanced being. <laughs> we'd love to keep you here. 
the problem is if you stick around too long our planet vibrates in such a way that your you will your heart will explode like a chest burster in that earth movie of yours yeah. Yeah. uh alien i i do think it's interesting how like oh yeah we have we have like plants and animals are are they are they on a lower vibrational frequency than and then how do they like this is the thing that I keep coming the, the whole vibrational frequency thing only makes sense when you're talking about like humans well it doesn't even make sense but the only way that like they that people seem to think about it is like humankind and being quote unquote good or bad and and like aliens if you want to like put it up to that but like are apes on the vibrational frequency yeah. spectrum does it, that are they able to coexist could could an ape go on meton is it just because if you're a human you're off vibe the way you make any of these kinds of things work is if you just do not think about it beyond what is immediately being told to you yeah so maybe apes are just really fucking chill and yeah that could just, be it can just like adapt to any I would vibrational chill with frequency ape. i would love to chill with an ape yeah so because she wasn't allowed to go back to meton because it would actually kill her um there were they she had occasional visits from ailing and akon and also started to have these um like 3d video calls with them every once in a while like through okay some form of like either telepathy or that like room uh what do they call it the electric mirage technology electric or something mirage. which okay. she never saw like i i or at least i never no one ever, she never showed having an electric mirage to anybody. So I don't know exactly how she had these things, but supposedly she basically like Skyped with her kid <laughs> from across the galaxy. Okay. Yeah. Um, now the entire trip there and back supposedly took about four months, but she, she tried to, to like, there's something to do with like how the time lines up or anything, but she spent like a lot longer on Meton in terms of how long she was there versus how long it took in like earth time. I don't exactly know. There's something about there being like a nine year stay on Meton, but it was only four months of earth time. I don't really know how that all lines up. Yeah, that's, I don't think that's usually how space travel stuff works, but whatever. Yeah. So supposedly Akon and uh, Ailing would then of course at, at when he grew up a little bit, started to just travel the, the universe in a spaceship together, like doing the whole like, kid learning on the road thing that, that the Venusians do. Um, and those, that was when they would kind of come and visit every once in a while and, and hang out with, with, uh, with Elizabeth. So that's, that's kind of the main thrust of the, the kind of contactee stories of Elizabeth Clare, but I do have some more just random stuff about Meton and everything. And also some stuff about her later life. If we want to get into that. Absolutely. So let, let's just get more Meton stuff and then we'll end with kind of her, the ending of her life. Um, so here's how she described the construction of the ships that she was in. Uh, she said the ship is created in space from pure light energy into substance mm. and it takes naturally the celestial form. They then bring her to the surface of the planet and construct the interior, but the whole skin of the ship is created in space in order that this atomic structure of the skin of the ship is conducive to energizing. That's how you get the power and the different colors. So the colors are like part of the whole like energy way that it travels so fast and stuff throughout cool, space. Cool, cool. So none of that makes sense, but whatever. No. That's fine. And, well, is the, the material metal? No, it is not like a metal at all. It is more like a porcelain. It is made of an atomic substance from pure light energy, which is the ultimate particle. <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, whatever. You know what? I'm not going to try and make sense of that. Yeah. So this one I thought was interesting. Uh, what is a woman's life like on Meton? So this is all the, from that, like, uh, Stuart, um, yeah. uh, Stuart, Sorry. Stuart I'm, Bush interview. I'm fixated on the idea that light is the ultimate particle. I, it, has, look, sorry, yeah. that, you got to take it as red. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There are no chores as we have on Earth. It is all done with a light ray. For example, a mm. beam of light will bring you your food on a tray. Families are larger. Most what? families have about seven children. What? Sorry, go. You want to talk about the 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 tray on a beam of light? I don't know if I can. So, so you're wait what? So you're just, wait. Light just does everything on this planet. Are, is she saying that like you summon food with your the light, or is it like yeah. somebody's prepped your hamburger and fries and you click a button on a? It's like flashlight. the Pizza King station train. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> everybody has a, everybody on Meton has a pizza king installed in their homes. <laughs> and it just this beam of light that which we've shaped like a train just for fun <laughs> brings you all anything you need on, on its train. Uh, but if if it's not your order, you have to let it pass because someone else may have ordered it. They also have a Sega Genesis installed. <laughs> or you can play Battletoads V Double Dragon yeah. while you wait for your shitty Hell yeah. pizza. Hell yeah. I, I used to I always used to go to try to that get that booth or the comic zone booth. Oh, I always played the Sonic booths. Anytime See, there's a Sonic game. I had Sonic at home, but Ooh, I didn't have I did Battletoads and Double Dragon or Comic Zone. I had Sonic the Hedgehog at my, uh, after both my parents worked, and so I got into, uh, like, kinder care. Uh-huh. And if you were good, you got to play Sonic. And then Pizza King, where I could play some Sonic. I still have, I, I know you know this, we lived together for yes. years, but I still have my original Sega Genesis know, with everything. Like, it's super it's sick. kind of cool. Um. I, I still you could open up a pizza king i could, <laughs> I could open up a pizza king because i have <laughs> one Sega Genesis, yeah. and, and no, you're familiar with pizza no trains i uh, have made pizza before um you just go here it's so fucking easy you go to little caesar's you buy a <laughs> bunch of hot and readies and then you flip them for like six bucks instead of five uh, easiest well, they're, shit look, in the world they're 555 now so you okay. probably have to flip so, like, them for like seven seven yeah. whatever easy jesus <laughs> and then then and i and i co i cooperate with a local like hobby store to get the train so right. they get cut into the profit exactly so you're gonna have to charge it eight to nine maybe ten Bucks per a slice piece of, yeah, a sli- yeah oh wow look the ec- the economy's in shambles yeah, the, the economy's in shambles and if this there's one meton, thing we're not perfect the public is cl- just absolutely clamoring for it is the return of the video game Pizza Kings. Yeah. Do you think they got game cubes in those things by now? <laughs> Considering I was still, they still had Sega Genesis when we were in like the PS2 generation. Yeah. I think we're probably, they probably are at, at like Wii or okay. Sega or, or uh, uh, GameCube. At this oh point. God. We would be a total disaster. Just people flailing around in their booths. <laughs> imagine, imagine a Pizza King station trying to use Wii U's. That would be amazing. And you have the fucking game pad. <laughs> that would be that would be fucking awesome. They they Those somehow would be smeared with so much grease. Imagine Pizza King partnering with like Nintendo to create like a, a Pizza King ordering thing on the game pad. <laughs> hey, actually, let's that's a good idea. Let's, because no one wants we use anymore. Let's right. just buy them all just up. Buy them all up. Turn it into a menu. Yeah. No also- games though. <laughs> You have to use a separate game pad to <laughs> yeah. play the games. Yeah. This no, this is the ordering game pad. <laughs> yeah. That's I think we got a great idea going here. We should get in contact with Mr. Oh, King. Oh fuck me. All right. So most families have about seven children. And you can have That's children while thousands of years old, as there is no problem with age. Sorry, are these aliens Mormons? <laughs> these aliens. Well, these aliens are just perfect in every way, so they can have and a lot of kids. And the perfect society has a bunch of kids, huh? And you just have a bunch of babies. A bunch of babies, and also you live to, like, thousands of years old. That, I, you know what? I'm not even going to say it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Now, they do use a natural contraceptive, a type of vegetable that is found on their planet, <laughs> which they put in their fu- their food. Oh, I thought you were going to say, like, in their... In their no, they, they, don't, they don't put it... <laughs> You don't fuck it. You, you, or okay. to, well, I don't know. You, just uh, you, c- you, you eat it. So there is no marriage or divorce. They simply find their mate and stay together for life. Oh, okay. so hey, you don't- so there. <laughs> Sorry, what were you? I, I don't mean that. What were no, you? No, there, there's no. Uh, so there's no contract on it. There's no keep the government out of my marriage. Like right. You just there's no marriage. You just find a mate and stay with them forever. Okay. So- Which is why uh, Akon, who had found Elizabeth in a former life, um, on Venus. He he had to come back to her because they're they're together forever. Right. So they time. are a type of Christian at the very least, if not Mormon. There there is like much of these things when we're talking about like aliens. Th- there is kind of a Judeo Christian backbone to yeah. a lot of like the concepts of like a perfect society. You can, yeah, you can tell it's a it's like a perfect society as crafted by the mind of somebody with with human 
experiences <laughs> when it's like, yeah, the perfect society, they have seven children and they never get divorced. <laughs> and there's a strong gender binary, yeah. with only heterosexual yeah. relationships, yeah. monogamy you, forever. <laughs> yeah. It's, it Beautiful. is kind of like. Perfect. I mean, did I mention okay. that they're white? Yeah. Did I? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> uh, yeah. That that's that's another side of this whole thing that we never that I don't think gets discussed enough. Yeah, no, definitely. There is a very weird racial undertone with that. Yeah. For sure. Uh so she, she does say if there's an accident and a loss of light, the person simply reincarnates and comes back to their same mate. So that's that's what happened okay. with her. Okay. Okay. Now this this is this is the might be my favorite question of all of them because of the the answer is fantastic. Why don't they have competitive sports on Milan or Metan? Oh, oh boy. Milan. <laughs> oh boy. Okay, here we go. They don't think about it. It is not necessary for them. Earth <laughs> Earthman, when he is not Earthman, when he is not involved with wars, etc., needs to release his aggression in sports and such competitive activities. Yeah. The Metan do not have this problem. Okay, but hold hold on a fucking second. Yeah. Isn't this the the South African like polo entrepreneur or whatever like, yeah well well, because she she's from earth at least in this in this reincarnation so she has an aggressive aggressive tendency but so she's she just a pilot that the men have the aggressive tendencies no uh well earth man as an earth people okay okay i don't think that is specifically gender okay fine fine i just i okay so they don't think about it i mean but like that they, they don't care about competition because they're not aggressive and have no war Right. Therefore, like, and I, you know, you hear this, you hear this whole thing about how like the drive for competition and, um, and like sports and everything is based on this, uh, need for like dominance that is inherently linked to like aggression and, and war and everything as like a lot of the early quote unquote early sports in like ancient civilizations were, were to like settle, basically settle things without actual war as like right. a substitute. I don't know if any of that's true. That's just like the thing that people say, you know, it's like the whole like wolf pack yeah, thing like, that we talk about where it's like the whole alpha of the wolf pack thing, which is actually bullshit. Well, yeah, the, it, uh, not only is it bullshit, but like it was being the fact that it was be, like being applied to like some sort of hierarchy among humans is also bullshit. Yeah, it's just, yeah, whatever. whatever. So uh, like, I think that's kind of the concept here is like, oh, because they don't have war or crime or any of that kind of stuff it also it also more all of this stuff moralizes quote-unquote crime in a really weird way of like taking out yeah. any sort of like actual impetus for why that quote-unquote crime happened right in a way that that is very um crime is defined by the by the ruling class <laughs> right i don't know i don't know how it was in south africa but like you know at least for for how we experience it in in America, crime is is definitely just like utterly like devoid of context and is yeah. like, uh, yeah, totally. Yeah, I get what you're saying. That that's a whole other thing. Like that that's not for this podcast, but it, it's it's just one of those things that I, the more I read about utopian alien societies, the more I like feel like I kind of unpack just the assumptions made about a society as a yeah, whole. Yeah, yeah, and and how it's like everything is based on these weird twists of like what suppo the supposed natural order is. It's, it's a whole thing that just kind of, I think about way too much when I'm reading these things, but yeah, it's so let's just keep going. Um, so like we said earlier, the mother planet is Venus. Uh, they, they eventually, when they left Venus, set up way stations on the earth, moon and Mars. One of those was Atlantis, which was eventually destroyed. Uh, however, the civilization civilization from Venus decided to leave Earth due to the harsh nature of the variable sun and move to the neighboring system, aka Proxima Centauri, um, which led to their whole like Meton thing. But supposedly, uh, they left some people behind and also started to like commingle with with the the beings of Earth um, post Atlantis. So some of the kind of their works including like pyramids still exist in Central America. Oh, they did that. Some of them. Not not like the Egyptian pyramids, oh, okay. but like but, but some, some of the of stuff them. in Central America. Gotcha. And uh they because Atlantis was where they were, they there they had a base also. Okay. So they had Atlantis as their main base. They also had a separate base in South America, and some of the Incas are descendants of the people from Venus. And also um 
in, in the Andes, there used to be a very tall, fair race of people, many redheads. These also oh, were from Venus. Oh, this is a thing that I've heard about a bit yeah. too. How do you think the how do you think the Venusians felt when they like maybe they like left their like Argentine Argent Argentine base mm -hmm. and then like come back and they're like what the fuck Hitler's somebody's here? here Hitler's here yeah what the fuck <laughs> hey man you got to get the fuck out this is ours yeah well well the, I feel like Hitler already had some sort of contract with them from like their south their like South Pole base or whatever the fuck oh right in right. Antarctica um so so maybe I don't actually I don't know if. I think those were greys. I forget exactly who all, I think it was greys and reptilians for the Nazi Antarctican, Ant Antarctic base. We can go ahead and say that the, yeah. the, the tall Nordics also were involved Whatever. somehow. Yeah. They, look, they, they probably, even if they weren't specifically involved, they were probably cool with it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. <laughs> I think that's a good assumption to make. Uh, yeah. So th that's kind of a lot of the stuff about that, that she said about uh, the, the Meton aliens. It's and weird. The aliens. It, I wonder if they got, this this planet's like inspired the the character in Undertale, who I think is also named Meton. I could be wrong. Oh, also, yeah, I have I, no idea. I'm pretty sure I, there's I, also one of the uh, the new gods. In, oh, is Meton? Is Meton? Yeah, the, who rides like the chair? You know? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Claire actually published a book about all this stuff in 1980. So this is like when she's like 70. Um, and she this it was called Beyond the Light Barrier and. Uh, it, it seemingly did fine. Like people read it and, and it kind of became somewhat known. Uh, but even early, like earlier than that, George Adamski made a point to visit South Africa in his lecture tours in the late 1950s, specifically trying to find Clara for a chat on the variety of her experience with these friendly wise space brothers. Uh-huh. 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 So Claire, at this point, Claire was, was not the only Adamski follower to experience supposed motherhood of aliens. So she was one of the first, if not the first, in this kind of area of, of birthing aliens. Um, but she was not the only one. That was her and uh, Dana Scully. Yeah. <laughs> Spoilers. So um, throughout the rest of her life, she continued to kind of do a lot of this stuff. Like she... Not the aliens. Fuck aliens? <laughs> oh. No. Uh, although, she, she, I guess she was still Skyping with her son or whatever the fuck. Um, but she she did uh, do some some kind of press about it and and work on her book that got released like 25 years later. Hmm. Um, she moved from Natal to Johannesburg after her sister and brother-in-law died. Uh, she worked at a, a bookstore in the city but found that life stifling. So she basically just became like a press person. Like she, she would just do interviews about her extraterrestrial stuff from there on out and became kind of like this just presence in the UFO community for the rest of her life. Um, she basically would just do interviews with anyone who wanted to do it. Uh, she um, had stuff published in the Flying Saucer Review in 1956. And it was noticed by a woman named Edith Nicholson who then she corresponded with for the next 20 years um, and had some of that story published in a, a book in, uh, I think, Norway in like the late 1950s. Um, she then started to work on a manuscript for her own book and uh, was interviewed by Cynthia Hind in 1968. For, who's a, she was a ufologist. And there's a big write up on of her story in a magazine called Fate, uh, out which then oh, led to, yeah. mm -hmm, which then led to another out, uh, thing in another magazine called Outspan, and uh, there were more people that supposedly saw Akon ship in January of 1984. So supposedly uh, he still was coming back oh, around. Okay. Um, yeah. So like she basically did, even went to like UFO conferences, had a lot of interviews. I think she effectively just like worked um, in the like UFO community for basically the Until rest of her died. life. Yeah. Uh, her, her third husband died in 1981 and even, and his ashes were strewn on the flying saucer Hill. And Elizabeth then died a couple years later in 1994, I think. I'm sorry, but it's kind of unfair to call him husband when he's a side piece. 
<laughs> to, to Akon. Well, they never got married, so. Oh, fair. Yeah. She, 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 you're the side piece to her eternal soulmate, Akon. Right, from the that's what I'm Meton. saying, yeah. Uh, and she was working on a second book at the time of her death called The Gravity File, which was left unfinished. Um, it was supposedly going to cover some more of the gaps of her first book, which talked about, uh, it was going to talk about the military and political aspects of UFO research, explaining Akon's electrogravity propulsion technology. And she also, um, before her death, told various acquaintances that Ailing was now an astrophysicist and who she was still, he was still crisscrossing the universe with his father, his space woman, Clea. I'm guessing that means his like oh, soulmate, his soulmate and their son. So okay. now she's, she died a, a grandmother. grandmother. Wow. So yeah, that's An the story of Elizabeth Clara. Amazing. I, that's so it's classic, but with its own flavors. That's the thing. Like, and that's wonderful. I love, I'm really enjoying finding these stories from like the fifties and sixties and even like a little They're before the because like we've talked about this. It's like it, it's before it got so rote. Yeah. And a lot of the stuff ended up being the basis for modern UFO contactee lore. It, it then like space brothers gave way to a more like scary kind of, uh, contactee being probed and attacked and yeah. stuff later. Um, but I, I like seeing like the origins back before when people still were trying to figure out what alien contact was, you know, yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. They established a, a canon at least for a handful of decades there. It's, it's always interesting The the, the fifties and sixties is probably the coolest era for UFOs for sure. Yeah. I would agree. So let me answer your big question before you ask it. Yes. I would fuck an alien. That you're you're kind of close, but uh, let, let me let me ask the actual question. Okay. Would we were soulmates on your former life on Venus work as a pickup line on you, or if not, <laughs> what kind of alien pickup line would would work? Oh my god! I mean, so let let me unpack that idea because it, yes, it would work on me, but the problem with that pickup line is the fact that like it would work on me if you knew me well enough to know it would work on me because if you don't know me well enough to know that that pickup line works on me, then you're just saying crazy shit to me. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. like you're just, but yeah, that, Hey, if that was like, if there was somebody <laughs> who knew me well enough to, to do that, then yeah, that would work on me. 100%. So, hey, if anyone's swiping through on Tinder and oh, comes Jesus across Kyle, Christ, no. say we were soulmates on the world Ugh. on, on, in your former life on Venus, WYD question mark. And there you go. I You're in. Would I would delete the app so fast, <laughs> Nile? Oh God. Yeah, no. I mean, yeah, it would work. It would be like, but like I said, a random person saying that to me yeah. is like almost scary. Yeah. So so as a pickup line, like as a like cold. No, not knowing the person pickup line that would not work on you. Probably not. Okay. Probably not just because I would be like, wow, that's a, uh, that's fucking crazy. But also a big coincidence given my, uh, my <laughs> podcast, uh, yeah, uh, the history. episode's not even out yet. How yeah, do you know this? That, that That's, that's kind of fucking crazy. So I, I, I was thinking about this because like, I, I feel like in terms of this question, such a, such a, a lot of the answer is based on who is asking because right. if, if they are just like a person, it would be a much harder thing because then it's like, what are you, what are you talking about? But if, if it's like a noticeable alien, then it's like, okay. Hmm, yeah. If it was an alien, if it was like, if this was like an actual alien, then it would also work on me, unfortunately. Cause that could go either way. Yeah. I could either have an experience like she had, or it could be some alien tricking me into being like, I don't know, succulated by an energy vampire yeah you, you could end up in a in a human um zoo centipede on fucking zoo. uh whatever yeah i, I was trying i, I can't. alpha centauri yeah somewhere in alpha, somewhere in alpha, centauri. alpha the, the human zoo in alpha centauri so that that's the thing like i think it would work something like that would work like honestly if you're an actual alien like noticeably the experience is wild enough that that you don't really need much of a pickup line i don't think yeah I, I I think to make an alien based pickup line work as a random person, you'd have to like put a funny spin on it. Like, are you 
are you uh I flew all the way from Alpha Centauri and boy, boy my arms are tired. Stuff. That's good. That's a good pickup line there. You don't even make an attempt to like flirt with them. You just like crack a joke about flying in from Alpha Centauri. No, it's like, uh, are you an are you an angel? Because I come from the fifth dimension. Did it hurt when you? Did it hurt? Did what hurt when you fell from the Area Fifty One wreckage? I don't know. I can't think of anything funny. I'm I've never been a pickup line guy myself. No. I'm perfectly fine for somebody to use it on me. Nobody ever has, but uh if they made a funny little spin on an alien thing, that would be kind of that would be kind of fun. Yeah, I don't think I've ever used a pickup line in my life. Never in my fucking life. Are you kidding me? Um, Can you imagine? No. Like oh, no, no. It it uh, pickup lines feel weird to me. I I would never use a pick I I, I just, I don't know. I just talk to a person. Just be like normal. Yeah. So I, I don't, I, that's the thing. Like I was trying to think through of like, what would it take? And honestly, everything that I like trying to come up with anything, it was just basically like, oh, an alien telling me random shit about alien stuff. Like, yeah, it was like, oh, they're going to have a conversation with me, which is not a pickup line. So I, yeah. I had a lot of trouble coming up with an actual answer to this question. It's tough. So it really comes down to like a, kind of a, a very simple equation here. If you are an alien, then you don't really need a pickup line, but go for it. Whatever. It works. I don't give a shit. It would be such a wild experience. Fuck it. But if you just use that pickup line on me and you're a person, then yeah, delete Tinder it's, immediately. There's a, there's a flow chart here on whether or not that's acceptable. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, maybe I should just start using it myself and just like see what happens. Cause like, <laughs> how, how hard is it to get banned from Tinder? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm just saying, like, you know, maybe like the one person who's like interest you peak, yeah. who's just like Venusians, a eh? okay. Like maybe, maybe, maybe that one person's like super cool or just totally not cool. I, it's, it could go either way. It's, I mean, that, hey, isn't that all flirting is flipping a goddamn coin <laughs> on the person that you're flirting with? Yeah, I guess. I don't know. So I, that would be how many patrons do, would we have to have for, to, for you to like actually give this a shot on somebody oh, on, t- on, on Tinder. I, I, I love how, I love how whenever we are like, how much money would it take for Kyle to do this thing? It's all, it's like, uh, I have to taste my own piss. I have to, I have to like <laughs> do all these things. It's like, it's going to, it's going to cost you, you folks out there a lot. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, <laughs> fair enough. Yeah. That, that, that honestly, like, when it comes down to something like this, it's it's borderline like harassment, and yeah. we don't want to do that. I don't That's awful. Anybody. So even for a, a really really funny podcast joke, uh, not worth it. So yeah, I honestly, I I more just wanted to have this conversation than have an actual answer to this That's, question. That's very fair because it is it is a fun conversation. Uh, email us your pick alien pickup lines that would work on you. Yeah, what what would it take? What would it take? So on that note, let's go and take care of some business. You can follow us on Twitter at IGW Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook.com slash It Gets Weird Podcast. And we're on all your favorite podcatchers from Stitcher to Google Play to Apple Podcasts to Spotify. I said Google Play. Google Podcasts Google. is what I meant. Google Play is like the fucking app store. Anyway, if you listen to podcasts somewhere, we're probably there. Just look up It Gets Weird. Email us at It Gets Weird Podcast at gmail.com. What is your alien pickup line? Please, I want to know what would work on you. Uh, if we get some good alien pickup lines in the email, I'll read it on the show. Yeah. So. And uh, th- this is a great place to make use of for all, all of our patrons. This is a great place to make use of the Discord channel. Oh, true. Big question. True. That's true. We do have a section for people to discuss the big question on our Discord. So so uh, the way you get there, though, now here's what's interesting about that, yeah. is donating to patreon.com slash it gets weird at the $2 tier or the $5 tier. What, when you donate, you get access to our Discord and mainline episodes two days early, uh, and then you get access to bonus shows. On the $2 tier, you're getting I, It Gets Weird TV, where we're currently watching Gravity Falls. We watch a weird show on there, and we talk about it. Every other week, you're getting that episode. In the off weeks, at the $5 tier, you get It Gets Weird TV plus off week episodes that Niall and I do. Sometimes Garrett has his own thing that he does. Uh, and you get all a whole bunch of more content. We, there's so much fucking bonus content on our Patreon. Just check it out. And then we also have a $1 tier that's just kind of like, uh, kick us a buck if you like us. It's just a tip to say, hey, I like your product. I'm, you know, you don't get anything out of it. Just the satisfaction of supporting 
your favorite podcast. Uh, did I? Oh, right. So if you can't donate, yes, go ahead and tell your friends, tell your enemies, tell your congressmen all about It Gets Weird podcast, the greatest podcast about the weird. Yeah. On that note, I think that will wrap us up for the week. This has been It Gets Weird, and I've been Niall. And I'm Kyle signing out. Peace. Peace.